The Indiana Dunes National and State Parks both feature remarkable sand dunes that rise majestically over the southern shore of Lake Michigan. Each dune is special in its own way, but the incredible Mount Baldy is in a class by itself. Mount Baldy is recognized as one of the most iconic dunes in the Indiana Dunes National Park. It's known both for its size and also for the joy that it's brought to many people from decades of being able to come and stand at the crest. This immense dune offers an incredible vista. But what exactly is Mount Baldy? What is a sand dune? Sand has been drifting along the eastern and western side of Lake Michigan. And this current called the Longshore Current brings the sand down to the very bottom, the farthest south. Eventually that sand will make its way onto the beach It'll dry out and then wind will pick it up and move it up into a clump and start to form a dune. What we see throughout the Indiana Dunes is we end up with the four dune. It's the first dune system adjacent to the lake. When the waves and winds breach that, they can create these blowouts. And eventually over time, the blowout will grow into a parabolic dune. What's really important to understand about these parabolic dunes is how the sand moves. We have up here the Stoss Slope or the Windward Slope, and then we have the Lee's Slope, which is commonly referred to as the Slip Phase. And over time, if the winds keep coming from the same direction, without vegetation to stabilize this dune, the dune will continue to migrate backward. So once the sand reaches the summit of this dune, the angle, called the angle of repose, can't go over 34 degrees. Once these individual grains of sand hit this crest, they start to tumble down the side of the dune in something that we refer to as grainfall. Because of all this movement, Mount Baldy is what is known as a living dune. While to the naked eye it may appear to be stationary, the dune is in fact in constant motion. What we see here at Mount Baldy, it is it's literally swallowing up the forest. And if we were here 70 years ago, we would see that this back face of Mount Baldy was actually 800 feet further towards the lake. What we see happening today, of course, is that it's encroaching our parking lot. It's already removed one parking lot, and it's been moving at around a rate of 10 feet per year, which is absolutely unbelievable. And at the going rate, we will lose the road that I'm standing on in two to three years, and it's conceivable that within the next decade we could lose the entire parking lot. But its remarkable motion is not all that makes the sand here at Mount Baldy unique. Many visitors ponder its composition and its color. A lot of people always ask about that black sand that's on the beach. Is it pollution? And it's not. It's what we call heavy minerals. So the black sand are things like some magnetite, ilmenite, and some garnets even that are in there, and they'll create these lenses of black sand that you tend to see. And then inside the dune, we see them forming layers or laminations. So you'll see quartz, and then you'll see a thin black line. With so much incredible sand everywhere, it might seem like the main attraction on Mount Baldy. But don't be fooled, it's the plant life that makes this dune what it is. When there is vegetation on a dune, it stabilizes the dune. Most of the people in the Indiana dunes understand the importance of our native marum grasses. These grasses are very special because they actually need to be buried to grow. And so as the sands blow up, they constantly bury these marum grasses and the grasses will actually grow up and have extensive root systems that help hold the dune in place. So here we are on the western arm of Mount Baldy. And if we look around, we can see it's completely different than the dune itself. Here, we have oak trees, sassafras trees, and all kinds of low-lying shrubs that really help stabilize this dune. But we see this layer of duff, these leaves that are decaying year after year, really helping to make the sand here turn into soil. Now, this becomes super nutritious and can support and sustain all of this life. Of course, not all plants take so kindly to the unique environmental conditions of Lake Michigan. Even mighty oaks can be brought low by the high winds coming off of Lake Michigan. So one thing we can see when we look at this oak tree, it got buried by this dune. Inside, deep in the belly of this dune, this oak tree is decaying. So this is typically what people think of when they talk about the ghost forest. If you go ahead and you dig down, clearly see the difference in the texture 
part that is below the ground and still moist, it's basically just like potting soil. For 70 years, the oak has decomposed and there are now holes, cavities, where the trunk used to be. I think people for a long time assumed that once forests got buried, they were just sort of dead. What we understand now is that even in the inside of the dune, even though there's less oxygen, temperatures are cooler, decomposition is ongoing. Anyone who visits Mount Baldy today will notice that there is still ample tree coverage. We have these cottonwood trees. They will absorb any nutrients that they can gather from being covered up inside this dune. When their branch becomes buried, it will become a root. And if the root becomes unburied, say due to a big windstorm, it can be a branch again. So it can survive in extreme condition like being buried 20 feet in sand. The other adaptation these cottonwoods have that I, I really love are the, the leaves. If we look at the stem of the leaf, we see that the stem is fairly flat. That means when the wind starts to blow on the leaf, the leaf just kind of spins around and dissipates any of the excess energy from the wind. That helps keep the trees stable in these sand dune environments. This kind of adaptation doesn't happen overnight. Where Mount Baldy stands now once looked quite different. What we know about Baldy is that it's actually a new dune that's about 100 years old that covers up an older dune that's roughly 3,500 years. And we know this because of this soil layer. The term is called a paleosol, and so it gives geologists and scientists a really good ability to, no matter where they are on Mount Baldy, to sort of know where we are in age-wise. As we've been trying to figure out how the dune is moving and how to stop it from moving, it's important to know where this soil layer is. It also helps us to identify sort of maybe what will hold the soil better and what won't. This also helps researchers and park officials understand how the dunes change and move. One of the things that got me most excited about Baldy was when I was out here with a friend from the National Park Service, and they noted that when they were kids, they could not see the radio towers or the water tower in Michigan City from the beach. And what that made me start thinking about is the fact that we don't really understand how this dune is changing in three dimensions. We call that geomorphology. Geomorphology not only enhances our understanding of the physical features of landforms like the Indiana Dunes and Mount Baldy, but it can help planners prepare for the future. How does development along the shores of Lake Michigan, including the construction of piers, affect the movement of sand along the coast? How do changing lake levels affect erosion and the migration of the dunes? The shoreline used to be a fairly nice uniform shape. So we start adding these breakwaters in, they block that natural path for sand. So now on the far side of that breakwater, more sand is getting built. That means Baldy becomes something called sand starved. If we go back maybe 75 years, the shoreline or the beach might be over 500 feet further inside the lake. So we've lost this much beach and this much dune just due to having these breakwaters out there. One of the ways that Park Service and that the local partners and organizations have tried to help stabilize Mount Baldy was they did something called beach nourishment. And when they did this beach nourishment, it was through the use of cobble. So on heavy wave days like this, when the waves are crashing in, it's not pulling near as much sand back into the lake. And the Port of Indiana requires a very deep port. So they're constantly dredging out that port. Well, no better way to help save and re-nourish a beach than to reuse the sand that's located just a few uh, hundred yards away from uh, where it was dredged up. And then that sand is actually transported via barge just a little bit offshore where it's dumped and that sand will drift inward, helping to re-nourish those beaches. I always love to ask people, if you want to stop the dune from moving, where should we pay attention if we're trying to do restoration? The answer is we need to focus on the lakeward side. The sand is blowing from the lakeward side up and over, so we need to stabilize this lakeward side. And that is exactly why the Indiana Dunes has spent so much time, money, and manpower to go ahead and put in additional marum grasses. If you look around the landscape, you can see how successful the marum grasses have been. A lot of that is from stopping the traffic on Mount Baldy over the past seven to eight years. So for the first time, we are starting to see grasses that have taken a foothold and are successfully growing. And you can see the work that the grasses are doing. We can see along the top of Mount Baldy on the east side and the arm of Mount Baldy that we're standing on on the west side and all the inside covered now with marimbrass, we're seeing the foredune of Mount Baldy really starting to stabilize. 
that will prevent eventually the backside of Mount Baldy from moving. In April, this area was actually fairly flat, but with the high winds that we've had, and now these marum grass is growing, we can see a dune starting to form here. Even as scientists and rangers pursue this important work, you can do your part in protecting Mount Baldy by being sure to stay on the designated trails. Remember that the grass growing beneath your feet is crucial in stabilizing the dune. Only the main trail and beach are available to visitors except during special events, such as the annual Outdoor Adventure Festival in the fall. Working together, we can help ensure that this majestic dune stands tall for generations to come. The Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail is an incredible natural treasure, and you are an important part of ensuring its future. When you visit, be sure to follow all posted signs and instructions. Visit indianadunes.com to learn about all of the volunteer opportunities and spend time caring for this fragile environment. In addition to the National and State Park Services, a number of nonprofit agencies work tirelessly to preserve and protect the Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail habitats. Learn more about these important agencies and support their efforts with your charitable contributions. Finally, be a champion for the Indiana Dunes. Stay informed and use your voice to tell the story of this wonderful place. Help ensure that all visitors, the magnificent birds, the migrating butterflies, and friends from around the world can enjoy the Indiana Dunes Discovery Trail for generations to come. Check out the links below to get started.